Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the John F. Kennedy Forum. At this time, we'd like you to ask to turn off your cell phones and PDAs and all electronic devices. Our program will begin in just a few moments. 
Thank you for your patience and enjoy the program.
Good evening, everyone. My name is David Elwood. I'm the dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Needless to say, this is a remarkable evening and a remarkable event, uh, and we are extremely happy and extremely pleased uh, uh, to uh, have the president of Chile here with us tonight. Um, she has herself a remarkable history, and she is uh, someone who has taken over and led with great integrity and great vision a powerful and important country. Um, and uh, I want to, I'm going to turn over the introduction to my colleague here in a moment. But I want to just mention a couple of things quickly in passing. First of all, this afternoon, President Bachelet was, she traveled to Hyannisport to personally meet with Senator uh, Edward Kennedy uh, and gave Senator Kennedy the decoration uh, known as the Orden al Merito del Chile. Um, and it's the, uh, one of the highest honors you can receive. Uh, one of the interesting features about uh, the president is she actually lived in the United States for a period when President John F. Kennedy, the name sake of the school, was here, was the president. Um, and so we're obviously especially pleased and honored that this could happen. We actually think I have a picture of this event. Do we, is that true? We may or may not have a picture of this event. We, a uh, picture may yet show up. Um, but if not, we don't have a picture of the event. Uh, I, I do, would like to welcome, uh, but again, I, I would like to, pay my personal thanks for your uh, recognition of the senator who we all wish very well. And he's obviously someone who uh, is an example to, to many, both in this country and across the world. So it's a great honor. Uh, let me welcome a few special guests uh, before I turn it over. I, first of all, I'd want to honor the Honorable Mariano Fernandez, Chile's ambassador to the United Nations. Where are you? There you are. Thank you. Um, the Honorable Fernando Ayala, uh, Chile's uh, chief of protocol, right there. Um, and uh, I want to also uh, welcome Andres Velasco uh, back to the Kennedy School. Uh, he's uh, been a, a member of the faculty here in the past, and we all hope that that's also the future. Uh, but in the meantime, he's doing very critical work as, uh, uh, the, uh, as a minister of finance in, in Chile. Um, so, we are obviously enormously proud uh, of him and everyone else for, for being here in the service. So, uh, I do want to mention one other person who's here tonight, uh, Andranico Luksic, who is right here. And Andranico Luksic is one of Chile's uh, leading citizens, and he's actually one of the outstanding citizens of the world. Uh, right now, part of the reason for offering this special recognition is he's working closely for, with a partnership for Harvard University and with the Harvard Kennedy School that has a number of elements, including uh, research projects on childhood education and the like at the uh, David Rockefeller Center of Latin, in Latin America, but also providing fellowships to help the best and the brightest uh, Ch uh, Chileans and also people from other nations to come to places like the Harvard Kennedy School to learn and to return and help lead their country. So again, Andronico, we are enormously grateful for your participation. I'd like us to give him a quick time. Finally, I do want to very briefly mention the sponsors, uh, other sponsors for tonight's event, the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. And indeed, in a moment, I will turn this over to Professor Marilee Grindle, uh, who directs the center. Uh, in addition, uh, the Harvard Kennedy School Women in Public Policy Program, our Women's Leadership Board, uh, a group of women who, uh, from all, all walks of business, government, civil society, who actually will be traveling to Chile uh, later this in October. Uh, and uh, will be participating in activities there. And finally, the Council of Women World Leaders, of which President Bachelet uh, is a member. So to all of you and all who've been a part of things, my gratitude. Now let me turn it over to, Pres to Marilee Grindle, who will introduce President Bachelet. She is the Edward S. Mason Professor of International uh, Affairs, I International Development here at Harvard. Those of you that know anything about the Kennedy School know the Mason program is actually one of our great gems and we're enormously proud of it. She also directs the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. She had a long-standing commitment to this whole domain, uh, is well known to all of us who know her. She has this remarkable combination of intellect, of enormous uh, insight, 
and real grace. And so uh, we are, it's my very great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Marilee Grindle. Thank you very much, Dean Elwood. It is indeed a great honor to introduce President Michelle Bachelet of Chile. She is, as David has said, a remarkable person, a surgeon, pediatrician, an epidemiologist who studied military strategy, a moderate socialist. She supports market-oriented policies while promoting policies to reduce the distance between the rich and the poor in her country. A person of talent and energy, she has raised a family and pursued a career in public service. Her life mirrors the events that have shaped contemporary Chile. Her father, a general in the Chilean Air Force, held high-level position under the government of Salvador Allende in the early 1970s. When a coup led by General Augusto Pinochet ousted the government, her father was arrested, tortured, and then died in prison. Arrested with her mother in 1975, both President Bachelet and her mother were tortured and imprisoned by the military government. When they were eventually released, they went into exile. Returning to Chile in 1979, she resumed her medical studies and then pursued a career as a pediatrician, while also working with others to resist the dictatorship and to assist those who had been harmed by it. With the return to democracy in 1990, she dedicated herself to restore the country's public health system. She was chosen to be Minister of Health in 2000 and then the first woman in Latin America to be Minister of Defense in 2002. She distinguished herself in both positions. In 2006, she won election as president. In her acceptance speech, she said, violence entered my life, destroying that which I loved. Because I was a victim of hatred, I dedicated my life to undo this hatred and convert it into understanding, into tolerance, and why not say it, into love. One can love justice and at the same time be generous. As president, she has distinguished herself for economic policies that continue to make Chile's the strongest economy in Latin America. She has been a president who cares deeply about investment in the next generation and has served as an inspirational model for others in terms of social policy initiatives. With social policy in mind, I can um, uh, reiterate what David said. Um, Harvard University is currently a partner with the government and local NGOs in an innovative program for early childhood education in Chile, in Chile that we hope will further serve as a model and an inspiration to others. Indeed, President Bachelet, the relationship between Chile and Harvard University is strong in public health, in education, in social housing, the environment, biology, astronomy, we have a number of strong institutional relationships. We also, as the dean has mentioned, have on loan to you an excellent minister of finance. <laughs> we want to keep this relationship strong and relevant and growing. So, ladies and gentlemen, a remarkable person it is my very great honor to introduce President Michelle Bachelet of Chile. Welcome, Madam President. Thank you, Dean Elwood. Thank you, Professor Grindle. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And I am delighted to be here today and grateful for the Harvard Kennedy School invitation to speak at this forum. 
Almost 15 years ago, the then president of Chile, Eduardo Frey, spoke right here in the Kennedy School. He was introduced by Professor Graham Allison, who was particularly happy by the fact that under President Frey presidency, Harvard graduates had finally outnumbered Chicago graduates in high-ranking government positions. <laughs> and I am proud to report that in my cabinet, Harvard grads still outnumber those from Chicago. <laughs> However, I am not so sure that Elwood or Professor Allison are too happy about this anymore. As you already said, Chile's Minister of Finance, Andres Velasco, switched his office in the first floor of this building for a slightly bigger one in Santiago. And I'm sure it has not been easy to find someone to teach macroeconomic as well as he does. And I wanted to ask Professor Grindle if the accent was, the accent was in loan or in excellent when you spoke about minister. <laughs> but whether you have studied economics or not, I'm sure the following sentence will sound familiar to you. I quote, Inflation is a thing of the past, a scourge that modern economies have successfully eradicated. Uh, today it sounds surprising, isn't it? As surprising as that might sound, that is what economists optimistically believed for many years. But what do we see today? Inflation is back, and it sits at the top of the list of concerns of dozens of countries, including my own. Economists, though, were not alone in their overconfidence. There is a parallel there with politicians. Just as economists stop worrying about inflation, so politicians stop worrying about democracy. The optimism of the late 1980s during the third wave of democratization appears to have faded. The same politicians who struggled so hard to reinstate freedom neglected to consolidate and deepen democracy. Some scholars argue we are living a sort of uh, democratic recession. What is then the real state of democracy in Latin America today? As you all know, in 1980s, free elections and civil liberties were the main concern. Back then, our region was just emerging from a period marked by dictatorships, military coups, and the violation of human rights. Today, free and democratic elections are almost taken for granted in Latin America. In the last three years, 21 countries in the region went to the polls to elect their presidents. All those elections were free, competitive, and the results accepted. Between 1992 and 2008, in stark contract to earlier periods, there wasn't a single coup in the region. True, 15 elected presidents were enabled to complete their terms of office, but none of those crises resulted in a breakdown of democracy as it would have been in the past. That said, let me be clear, Latin America's democratic regimes are still vulnerable to many tensions and they are afflicted by many shortcomings. Because institutions are not as strong as they should be, and voters often feel that their democratically elected government failed to deliver public goods, basic public goods and services. Latin America is still burdened by public and private corruption, socioeconomic inequalities, weak political institutions, rising crime and violence, and a lack of accountability. Even stable democracies are suffering a loss of legitimacy. These countries are experiencing an either stagnant or decreasing levels of political commitment and electoral participation. And furthermore, they are often not responding adequately to demands for change. A large number of surveys tell us that in Latin America, voters are disenchanted with politics and politicians. In the eyes of the region's citizens, parliaments, political parties, and courts are corrupt or at least not to be trusted. And this lack of trust has obvious consequences. Our citizens increasingly prefer to express their opinions directly, 
bypassing the traditional channels of political representation, such as political parties or Congress. Apathy is also in a rise, especially among young people who are reluctant of participating in civic issues and elections. This enchantment is further increased by the widespread perception of large business groups and the media as having too much influence. Television's almost exclusive focus on superficial events and catchy sound bites, often lacking any political debate and content, further undermines the quality of public debate. In other words, what I mean by saying this thing, it's not that I am pessimistic, it is that we have a lot of things to do in order to consolidate a, 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 a powerful democracy and in order that citizens feel to be part of this democracy. In other words, the great advances achieved by our democracies over the past quarter of a century are being eroded by unresolved problems. And I don't need to tell you about the dangers that can imply. Disenchantment with politics can quickly lead to populism, and from populism, there is a steep and often short road leading to a loss of democracy. So what's my point? I think that at times we forget that democracy is not only of the people and by the people, it's also for the people. We forget that in addition to free elections and universal suffrage, modern democracy also calls for the equality of opportunity that has its roots in access to education, healthcare, social security, and housing, just to name a few. We forget that democracy must permit and promote citizen participation at all levels. It must, in other words, be inclusive across all areas. A successful democracy must deliver public goods, particularly to those who have made great sacrifices in recent years, but as the poverty that still exists in Latin America shows, have received little in return. Today, 205 million Latin Americans live below the poverty line. That, it's true, it is better than before because it represents a drop of 10% in the last four years. But 205 million are still too many. And we think it's frankly not acceptable. And I think that one of the important thing of this General Assembly is on the 25th, we'll be discussing the uh, Millennium Goals and how we can really um, fulfill them and achieve them because, we, because of the financial crisis and because of the food crisis. Uh, many countries, uh, could not only not advance, but can go back in, 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 its, uh, in its result. Moreover, income inequality in Latin America remains worse than in any other region of the, of the world. And that, that is not only the only type of inequality still in place in our countries. There is also gender inequality, ethnic inequality, and the difference in the access to best basic public goods and services that exist between, for example, our urban or rural population, to name just some examples. So if I put this uh, point, put out this point, it's because I think that urgent action is required to address our democracy's new challenges. Yes, we have president and parliament elected, great, but that's not enough, we, not, we have to do more. But how can we clearly spell out these challenges? First, we must never forget, as we did in the past, that procedural democracy matters. A democracy which does not ad adhere to established rules is simply not a democracy. And one of our key objectives must be the strengthening of civil liberties and representation. Second, we must ensure that our democracies can effectively address and respond to growing social demands. I mean, democracy has to deliver. This means investing in human capital, in education, health care, health care, housing, and social security. And it also means complementing the present role of the state. If the benefits of our economic policies are to reach all our citizens, we cannot afford to have a weak state. The complex challenges of today's world call for a stronger, not a weaker state. But it must be a state that is efficient and professionally managed, that facilitates the implementation of effective, targeted policies to remedy the many failings of the markets, 
precisely what the Kenyan School of Government teaches so well. We know that the defeat of poverty and of inequality requires an economic growth, of course, but growth alone is not enough. If social cohesion is the anchor of democracy, then well-focused pub public policies are vital. That is what we have been, have been implementing and will continue to implement in Chile in these 18 years of democracy. We have come a long way. From 1990 to 2007, our growth rate averaged 5.5%. In that period, Chile's GDP per capita almost tripled. And despite public demands and demonstrations seen by some as a symptom of stability, but in fact, a normal feature of democracy, recent data on political stability puts Chile on a par with OECD countries, ahead of the average for East Asian countries and far ahead for other Latin American countries. The same is true when one looks at indicators like quality of institutions, control of corruption, and economic competitiveness. As a result, Chile is today far more inclusive society than it was 20 years ago. Between 1990 and 2006, poverty rate went from almost 40 to 13.7%. Today, seven out of 10 university students come from families in which neither parents had access to that level of education. And you mentioned, uh, Professor Hindle, uh, our work in um, um, initial education, and that's been a, a big effort that I'm doing because I'm convinced that inequality comes from the crib. I mean, you have to give the child the best conditions since they are just born so we can label the play field, I would say. Otherwise, the possibilities of growing as a um, complete, a comprehensive, uh, developed uh, young and, 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 and adult, it's, it's much more complicated. And I hope, I'm looking forward to work on that, in that uh, program also. Um, yes, um, income inequality is still high in Chile, but there appears to have been a change in trend and it is dropping, only slowly, but dropping. And I would hope if I sh could come back in some years more, not to tell you that it was, it was, uh, um, a ghost, it was uh, something that was not clear. But over the last 10 years, the Gini coefficient in Chile has fallen from 0.58 to 0.54. The importance of the state's role becomes obvious when looking at Chile's income equality, excuse me, inequality. The richest fifth of Chilean earns three, 13 times more income than the poorest fifth. But if states' benefits and social policies are taken into account, this gap drops to 6.8, so from 13 to 6.8. Research shows that in the 90s, 80% of the reduction of poverty was a result of economic growth, or in other words, of a trickle down from the rich to the poor. But that in 2006, exactly the opposite was true. And 80% of the reduction was due to the government's social policies. In other words, our economic growth yet gets more and more efficient in our struggle against poverty. The question then is, can we, from the state, build a more fair society? And the answer is, yes, we can. And I obviously wouldn't want anyone to think that uh, this is a reference to a particular reason, person. <laughs> Remember, I also wear lipstick. <laughs> so, So yes, yes, we can change things, and we can do so from the state. An active state is, of course, nothing new in Latin America. But during many decades, the state sometimes lost sight of its purpose and was captured by different interests, military, political, private, and other interest groups. At the same time, we, we learned that there are many situations in which the market left alone fails to provide appropriate and lasting solutions. Because of, or despite, this lesson, Latin, America's, Latin Americans continue to look to the state, to us, to create the condition under which markets can operate, but also step in and resolve problems for which the market cannot figure out an answer. And this is why institutions matter. 
Without institutions that work properly, the, st the state won't take us anywhere. And without a healthy regulatory framework, the market will, le will lead us in direction that might not be uh, beneficial. And if you do not believe this, just ask your friends on Wall Street. <laughs> Those of us, of us who consider them ourselves progressive recognize that in order to bring the state back into play, we must do so in a responsible, efficient, and professional manner. Third, the third challenge of democracy is to incorporate its citizens. We must promote participation as one of the pillars of the state's objectives. Research tells us that today citizens want to, be, want to be the subject, not the mere object of public policies. But our hierarchical institution have too often failed to incorporate the people's opinion in the design and implementation of public policies. And this is a mistake we must correct. And when you're talking about all other kinds of organizations and in business, I mean, it's so clear that the role that stakeholders can play is so important. So you, so you have better policies, so you are policy have legitimacy. But sometimes in politics, uh, that is not so well understood. And I think we have to correct this. We should not fear participation even when it means less power to the state, which in Latin America has traditionally been very powerful. We should not be afraid to cede power because in fact what we're doing is not to cede it but to devolve it. And we must do it so for two reasons. One, because public apathy can eventually erode the legitimacy of our democracies. And two, because we know that our citizens' input translate into more efficient public policies. It follows that we must implement institutional reforms that promote greater participation, more decentralization, placed besides on some issues, laws that encourage the participation of women or ethnic groups, and foster citizen legal initiative, and so on. The fourth challenge is one that is not always associated with democracy, but is vital for its survival, the rule of law. In many parts of Latin America, political authoritarianism may no longer exist, but we continue to witness a type of social authoritarianism that can be terribly damaging for our societies. The weakening of the rule of law results in many of the region's citizens being afraid of venturing out of their homes, walking on the streets, and using public spaces. In these cases, the truth is that the state, even on a minimum Bavarian definition, is simply failing in one of its key tasks. If we cannot go out at night unafraid, what is the difference between a democracy and a regime that imposes a curfew? What difference does it make if our freedom is restricted at the whim of a dictator or at the whim of neighborhood gangs. I'm not saying it's the same thing, but I'm saying it's the same fear that it's not beneficial for the development of a healthy society. Organized crime, corruption, inefficient judicial, judicial systems, and police brutality are among the issues we need to address if we want to improve the qualities of our democracy. And last but not least, there is a matter of human rights. Latin America has taken great strides toward eliminating and justifying imprisonment, torture, exile, disappearances, and executions of political dissidents. Today, the challenge is to defend and promote human rights in the broadcast sense, and that includes social rights, economic rights, but with new approaches that perhaps did not exist in the past. Social inequality is still extremely high in Latin America but income differences are not only an economic problem. They reflect long-lasting inequalities in other areas of public life due to, for example, the discrimination against women and indigenous people. In particular, we would like ethnic origin to be seen not as a reason for discrimination, but as a sign of the diversity that enriches our cultural history. We would like Chile's indigenous people to be and to feel they are increasingly part of the political process from which they have been excluded for so long. People today are ever more aware of their citizenship or, in other words, of the rights they have and of those they still lack. 
This represents a great challenge for our governments because the realization that, quote, we are equal, but some are more equal than others, is a painful one that people experience too often. We do not want this to be the rule. The governments of Latin America must not only guarantee human rights, we, they must, or we must also guarantee them equally for all. Combating racism, intolerance, and all forms of discrimination is a priority for my government. As I have often said before, Chile somos todos. Chile is each and every one of its citizens. Chile is a country built by all the members of the society. My friends, in just 15 months, many Latin American republics will celebrate our bicentennials. And this is a good time to take a moment to look back at our achievements and forward to the challenges we'll still face. Clearly, we have made tremendous achievements. Today, Latin America is more democratic and the region's people are better off. Social mobility is increasing and women have greater opportunities than ever before. Some can even have president of their countries, <laughs> become president, two right now. But my message today is that there are still many important challenges for us to resolve. In the past, we thought we had clear answers to problems. Some to us refer to those answers as ideology. Others call them models. Today, we understand like that like in a bottle of good Chilean wine, the, the label is less important than the content. And we have a clear path we want to follow to achieve common objective. And that, I think, is indeed the great lesson of Chile's experience. In Chile, we still have much work to do, but our approach has, I think, delivered results. Even with public policies, sometimes weren't the best. I can imagine some of those. They have left us important lessons. And why is that so? It is because we have never lost sight of our overriding goals, more democracy, more economic growth, even more equality of opportunity, a better state, and expansion and strengthening of human rights. We had a dance towards those goals. We have maintained respect for the rule of law. We have opted for commitment and negotiation. We have been persistent in our efforts to deepen democracy while also being meticulous in the design of policies. We have allowed the market to create well-being and opportunities, but we have not allowed the state to neglect its responsibility in ensuring that these opportunities are open to all. The tasks that Latin American countries will face in the near future are indeed difficult and complex and we require as much as help as possible. So, Dean Elwood, although we will probably try to attract many of the Kennedy School students to work for a state, I promise I will not take away more professors. Thank you very much. I don't think you need to, but okay. you're welcome to. So some people make very long questions. Thank you very much, President Bachelet. It's uh, an enormous honor and a fascinating topic. Indeed, at, at times one does worry that democracy in Latin America is on something of a knife edge. The, the, on one side, it looks like a, a time when democracy and prosperity will reign together. At other times, it feels like we could go a very different direction. The president has graciously agreed to take, on, to take questions from the audience, and so I need to mention that there are microphones in four locations, one right here, one right here, uh, one right here, and one right here. Um, and let me just mention what the rules are about questions at the Kennedy School. The first is that you should identify yourself. The second is it should be short and contain only one thought. Uh, well, that means one question per, uh, per customer. And finally, it should end with a question mark. And so uh, with those uh, ideas in mind, we'll just go in a clockwise direction. I'm going to start right here. Hi, my name is Daniel Laje, a sophomore at Harvard College. 
Um, it is my understanding that you will be making a trip to Cuba in February for the Feria del Libro. Given that you yourself were a political prisoner under the Pinochet dictatorship, and that you are speaking today on democracy in Latin America, will you meet with political dissidents on the island as a sign that all dictatorships should be condemned? Or do you believe that there is a difference between dictatorships of the left and dictatorships of the right? We started with a very easy question, I mean, indeed. <laughs> Thank you so much for it. Well, it's, it's probably that I will go in, gen in February there because I've been invited. And uh, there is this, like in many other countries I've been to, this uh, um, ferry of, uh, ferry, no, it's not ferry, uh, fest of the books. And uh, Chile is the uh, guest, uh, is the country who is as guest honor invited. So I might go there. And uh, I want to tell you something that uh, with any country of the world, with any country of the world, Chile has also always had a relation of respect for its own decisions, but also, um, I would say, a relation of uh, openness and, and, frank and frankness to say what we think about it. But we always do it in private. So if I make any meetings, it depends what will go, if I go first of all, what the progress will be. And, uh, uh, but what I would say, if, uh, if I have something to say there, I would say to authorities in private. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right up here. Uh, and, thank you for and, coming. Excuse me, and I don't think left or right, if you, if you violate uh, he, uh, the human rights and the freedom, uh, probably uh, it's no different at all. I mean, we, I believe in freedom, and freedom is upon the colors of your, of your heart. Right up here. Um, hello, Madam President. Uh, my name is Daniel Lansford Rodriguez. Um, I'm a second year policy student at the Kennedy School, and I'm very active in the uh, Harvard Venezuela caucus. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, basically the relationship between Santiago and Caracas and how you feel that, I mean, they're both so technically uh, governments that have a relationship with socialism. To what way do you feel that your governments have similar goals or have differing goals? You sh <laughs> Journalists always ask me, how can I classify the governments in Latin America? Uh, don't worry, I'm going to go into the answer into your question, but I'll try to put it into context, OK? Um, and I usually say, let's not do that. Because from one hand, uh, we do share a common objective, all the, all the presidents, all the governments. And I've been talking about that, of all the uh, inequalities and problems that Latin America has. And we all want to tackle poverty, and we all want to, to create better opportunities for all, and, and we all want at the same time to, to develop, and so on. So uh, the thing is that Chile has decided when Chile recovers democracy, uh, we are now a 60 million people a country, at that time probably 12 million. Uh, we were pretty isolated in, in all areas from the rest of the world politically, socially, internationally, economically, and so on. And uh, the decision that the democratic government made at that time was to insert again in the world, open to the world. So, and on the other hand, we look at our country and said, how can we develop? And of course, when you have, a, at that time, 12 million people, country, population, and now 16, it's not in the internal demand, you know? Of course, you need to go out of the world. Uh, and so we decided to develop an export oriented strategy of development of our economy. So we started uh, working with the world, uh, understanding that this was a globalized world and that we would develop an open economy. And, um, and we, at that time, we have already signed like 57 or 56 FTAs all over the world. And we have a market, potential market, of 3,500 million people there. Because we, we signed uh, with, uh, of course, with the United States, with European Union, with China, Japan. And now we just signed working in Australia. And, and we have with P4, New Zealand, and so on. I could 
name many of them. At the same time, I, I've told you, we are dealing with inequalities, but, and we think the state has to have a, a clear priority on that, but we do understand that in order to, to achieve results, we need, of course, and because it's necessary, you have to in, improve, increase richness in the country, so you need economic growth. And we do believe at this time of our democracy in PPP, public-private partnership. We believe that there's lots of area which state is the best and has to do it, and, we, and has to regulate what is necessary to regulate, but other things the private sector is doing well, and we need to work together. So I will tell you that we, if you ask me, I, I think I already answered your question, because you could make your own conclusions if we are developing the same model or not. But I would tell you that uh, we, we do want the same things, but probably, and I still want the same things as 35 years ago, before the coup d'etat. But probably what I have learned in these 35 years is that you can have the same dreams, the same, the same uh, uh, I would say aspirations, but sometimes you, you can choose what it works, and you can be, uh, it's not to be only pragmatism, it's not mere pragmatism, it is that uh, I, I want to pass from rhetoric to, to results. And that's an instrument that has, has been, uh, can, be, can be changed in, in, in your perspective. So Chile has decided that, to be an open economy, an open, an open country to the globalized world, to see globalization that we know has a lot of problems for small countries. So we are really working also in the multilateral system to govern the globalization, because otherwise small countries like ours, or poorest country, have a lot of problems. But we do understand at the same time that globalization brings us lots of opportunities. So I would say we have the same objectives, probably in the sense of saying we want uh, a, better, a, a better quality of life for the Chileans, and probably uh, government uh, Venezuela wants the better quality of life for the Venezuelans. And, but Chile has chosen its way of doing it, and we think uh, we have had good results, and we'll continue that way. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Buenas noches, Presidenta. Buenas noches. My name is Kenzo Asahi. I am Chilean. Um, I'm studying at the second year of the Master's in Public Administration and International Development here at the Kennedy School. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you here. And my question is on Chilean leadership in Latin America. Like, it's a follow-up question fr from the previous one. So um, we're, most of us are very proud because, of, because Chile is assuming like a a position of leader in, 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 in the regional politics. And I wanted to ask you, which do you foresee that are, are going to be the main obstacles in UNASUR, in the Chilean leadership to, to a better democratic region? Which do, do you think are, are the main obstacles? And how do you, like, what are the plans to overcome these obstacles uh, if, if Chile really wants to be like a positive leader in, in the region? Well, thank you very much. Um, You know that um, I would say, if I had to look at the contingency, I would say, wow, last week we demonstrated that UNASUR could do it. Because Bolivia had the so difficult situations, and I called for an urgent meeting, and in less than 48 hours, everybody was there, almost everybody nine of 12 presidents, and the ones who weren't there was for very reasonable reasons. And uh, we, even though our differences, and f maybe some of the, it is a challenge, but it's also a, um, a strength. It is that inside the 12 countries uh, that are part of UNASUR, the Union, the Comunidad del Sur, the Nacional del Sur. Um, we have a lot of diversity in economic power and access to central issues like fuel, for example, energy. Uh, we have different political traditions, different, different levels of uh, development of political institutions. Um, 
Spanish is mostly the language, but still we also have Portuguese and English, and and it's not it's not uh, a stupid thing because that's that sometimes can be difficult to understand each other. But mainly we're all uh, former Spanish colonies, so it's also the culture is easier to get along. Um, so we have always said that the possibility that UNASUR will be um, an example or be the, a concrete possibility of what, since uh, um, Latin America was founded, the, the, the dreams of the founders, the great founders, no? the fathers uh, of integration, the way of solving problems. And I think that was true in the past, it's still true now, and it's more true than ever, because the kind of challenges we have, energy challenge, food challenge, and so on, really we won't resolve it each by itself. So why am I telling you this? Because even though we are diverse, we, if we can, if we could, and we could last week, but as I tell you, that's a good example, uh, respect uh, our diversity and unify it uh, in, around the, the main objectives that we have in common, UNASUR could be very, very, uh, it has a lot of potential, I would say, not to be so enthusiastic because we're just starting, you know. In May, it was just started in, in, in Brasilia because we just uh, approved the treaty. Now the treaties are on Congress and I'm the first president of, of UNASUR, uh, president pro tempore. What are the obstacles, you say? Um, not obstacle, but sometimes uh, the thing is that diversity can be a problem. Because diversity is not only diversity of institution, it's also some diversity in the way you want to solve things. Um, the, the, the thing is, and it's, pos it's, a, it's again good, is that all agreements in UNASUR must be made in by consensus, unanimous consensus. So that means that to get results, you need to negotiate as in anything in life, I would say. And of course, what would happen is that um, the negotiations, if they're not as fast as we need, maybe uh, UNASUR won't deliver. The results in many different areas that are essential. But uh, until, and, I, and many of the things I've already spoken in my, in, my, in my lecture, some of those issues can be a problem regarding UNASUR because our countries have all this a weakness in, 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 one, in one hand and, and strength in the other. But at the meantime, let me, let me stay, remain optimistic, because I think what we saw last week was very important, because we, we, we did something that is always important when you have a multilateral organization or multi-people, is that if you put in the center of your definitions, of your decisions, the main objective and you push all together uh, after it, you can get good results. And the thing is that Bolivia was the issue, not other issues. Of course, leadership in Latin America are different. People is different. The Chileans, we are always seen as uh, less, more serious people, not so colorful people, I would say. Um, and probably when we speak a little boring also. Um, <laughs> very serious people, isn't it? Yes, we are like that. And uh, that is a good thing on one hand, because people know they can rely on us. If we say yes, it is yes, and no, it is no. Um, but, uh, and, and, and there are this diversity also of leadership, because that's important too. Mm? But I think, um, I think we, we have the, <clears throat> the, the will, the political will, uh, the, um, and I hope the wisdom too, to, to not, not fail, not lose this wonderful opportunity to fulfill those dreams of so many people, to get a better Latin America for Latin Americans, if its leaders are able to put that dream in the center of the policies. Right over here. Presidenta Bachelet, es un honor dirigirme a usted. My question relates to the notion of economic progress 
and actually the globalization and free trade agreements that you talked about. Uh, Chile and China, I'm sure you know, but for the rest of the audience, signed a free trade agreement in 2006, which creates clear opportunities for the export of our natural resources. But our countries find themselves very, very far away. So my question is, what opportunities does this create for the export of Chilean ingenuity and hard work? Well, we, I think, um, first of all, we, we have uh, signed, um, um, what I would say, the first free trade agreement we signed were with Mexico, Canada, and United States, and then European Union, and most of them afterwards have been with the Asia-Pacific region. And uh, <clears throat> far away, all of them. But uh, there had been, uh, I don't have the figures right now, but it has been really impressive how it has uh, increased the, the, the trade exchange, um, the the, uh, the kind of uh, <clears throat> development and of investment that we have made. And uh, it has been really beneficial for Chile. Uh, as I told you, a small country, obviously, to go into a market of, what, 1,300 million people, it's, uh, it's, an important, it's an important possibility for Chile. And your question was specifically about engineer? Because... Uh Export of natural resources is obviously uh, an opportunity for Chile, but given the distances between the countries and the difficulties of learning the language and going all the way over there, what opportunities are created for the better kind of economic development where Chileans can actually uh, interact with people in China and start businesses or do business there? Well. I would say there's two things. First of all, we are exporting uh, natural resources, but not only exporting natural resources. We have, uh, uh, I mean, we have in Chile developed uh, a lot of policies regarding uh, how we can do a leap to development. And we said, okay, we don't have to continue doing exactly what we have done, we have to do something more. And not only the typical response is innovation and give more value to the natural resources, and we're working on that on copper, and we're working on that on, on, on food issues. And in that sense, we are working a lot on creating Chile as an agroalimentary potence. And in that sense, we have been working, and we identify eight clusters all over the country. And we're working on those clusters, uh, producing uh, more, I mean, to increase productivity, competitiveness, but also innovate. And in that, in, in, and in that sense, we also are uh, regarding a, uh, or developing a new pl plan. We, I already uh, talked about it on the 21st of May during my national lecture. Uh, it's like State of a Nation we do in Chile, the 21st of May, in front of the Congress. Uh, we decided that part of the, of the money that comes from copper will co go into this bicentennial fund. It's, we're talking about $6 billion. And it is exactly to develop a more, I would say, um, advanced human capital. And, uh, and, and that goes uh, from um, master degrees, PhDs, uh, also in technical areas, also in English, and also in Chinese. I mean, we are working in, in how we get together the peoples and how we open opportunities for our people, our professionals, but also this program so that can be a way to compensate you too. Include, say, uh, 100 teachers that we want to go every year to Chilean's university so we can get the best in some specific, so our people who are being educated in our country can have also the best, uh, the best possibility. So I would tell you we have been in the past training people in Chinese, for example, speaking specifically of China. But we do also have, uh, we, have we are working on FTAs with Australia, New Zealand, uh, and, and many other countries. And we are sending our people to work there, to study there, to, to work, and, and to, to come back to Chile with uh, better knowledge. But also with, chi with China, it's a bit more difficult, of course, because the language is so, so different. But we have been uh, developing also a program regarding Chinese, um, and Chinese people learning Spanish and as we are doing with English-speaking countries. So we have to do all of that. 
improve our human capital capacities, uh, innovation capacities, productivity and competitiveness. And that's related to many other issues, like uh, we have a national plan for infrastructure for competitiveness. You, I don't know if people know here, but Chile probably is the country in Latin America has the best uh, degrees of, uh, of um, for example, uh, <clears throat> excellent uh, um, highways and excellent security on, on airports. So we, have, we are degree A that I think are not many countries in Latin America. So we, we have in all of his, what is maritime security, we also reach all the best uh, standards. So we look ourselves also as a business platform or hub service country because we really have this network that can facilitate a lot. So on the other hand, we, with China, or with Japan, or with, uh, well, Australia, I mean, all the, we are an APEC country, as the United States, with all the countries of APEC. We look ourselves also not only as direct relation from one country to the other as a market possibility, but also as, uh, as I told you, as the, the, I would say, the entrance to whole Latin America. Because, uh, for example, if you are talking of any specific product, probably Chinese need millions of them, and maybe Chilean's economy would have enough. So we're working on the Pacific Rim arc with all the other Pacific countries so we can work together to, in the good sense, use this possibility, this, uh, this alternatives that Chile has developed so it could be useful and beneficial for other countries too. So we're trying to be also not only good students, but good comrades, good classmates. We're only going to have time for a couple more questions, but right here. My name is Pedro Guevara. I am a mid-career MPA graduate from the Kennedy School. My question is about geopolitics in Latin America. It's very clear that if we can group two economic development models in Latin America, we have on one side the Venezuelan model with President Hugo Chavez, and on the other side, the Chilean model not only in the academic environment, but the political campaigns, even the presidential campaigns in Mexico, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Peru, everyone has talked about the economic model of Chile. And so my, it's very clear that Chile has been exercising what's called soft power, according to deny uh, theories. My question is about, is it now that Chile is trying to exercise hard power? And I'm telling you that Chile is now among the countries that has the highest expenditure in, in arms. It's the second country with 3.6% after Colombia, who has the 4% of their GDP. Or is it that it's a part of a process of geopolitical adjustment in Latin America? On one side with the Venezuelan model, the economic model of Chile, and maybe Brazil in the middle trying to find a new equilibrium. And my final con uh, concern is about the trade-off between investing in arms and not in human capital. Thank and you. And not in what, excuse me? Human capital. And human capital. Well, I don't think we're, using, we're um, expanding $6 billion in arms, I could say, and we are spending $6 billion in human capital. But let me ask you, answer your question. And uh, I, I know this question pretty good because I was Minister of Defense, and I work also at... I study in the Inter-American Defense College here in Washington, D.C., too. So I know exactly. But it's not geopolitics at all. Uh, what we have done in Chile is to modernize armed forces. And we have modern... First of all, I would tell you that it would be interesting to see the figures, to see if all the... All, uh, every country includes the same figures. Because I can tell you, for example, in Chile, in the, armed, in, in the Ministry of Defense are still... Um, administratively, I mean, the money we use for that is uh, for police forces, militaries and, and police forces. Uh, for example, in other countries, they have a lot of money who they spend in anti-terrorist uh, war, but they don't put it in the Minister of Defense uh, issues figures. So sometimes I'm asking myself if we are putting apples and pears all together sometimes. But anyway, it, that's, I, I, I'm saying it because it has been something I've been questioning me for so long. Uh, but on, but on, on, on the more important issue, more than figures, because all of us who have worked with numbers, we know how numbers can be presented. 
First of all, I can say we have good numbers. We have good registers, and that it's a good thing, but sometimes it could be read in a, in a different way. But we want to have good numbers because we want to be very transparent. And because exactly it's not about geopolitics in the sense of that we are so happy with our statu quo. I mean, we don't pretend to expand our country at all. We are so happy with our country. It is that we are, I mean, we have a lot of problems, but I mean, I'm talking to the territory of the country, that we don't want any expansions. We don't have any of those uh, foolish uh, ideas uh, or crazy ideas. And, uh, and, and we have developed twice the book, what some people say, the white paper books of defense, where we put everything that we have there, clear, transparent. On the other hand, if you buy the Jane's report, you can find everything what every country has. So this is, this, is, this is a matter of transparency. But let me tell you something. When, when you decide to modernize your armed forces, and I can tell you also as a minister in the past and as the president now, I shouldn't tell it so out loud, but every year the, um, the increase of the Minister of Defense is for police forces fighting against the pub, uh, for public security. No? No. And, but I would tell you, when you want to modernize armed forces, and in Chile, after our experience, it was necessary to modernize armed forces from different points of views in different moments of our political history. And I'm talking after 90, not, not before. And one of them was to, so the Chileans will believe and, and love and respect their armed forces because they were the armed forces of all the Chileans. I would tell you, this is completely achieved. If you see uh, the last uh, surveys, when you ask the Chileans what are the more respectful institutions of our country, in the first place are always armed forces or police forces. And I won't tell you where politicians, Congress, and so on, justice is. It's <laughs> way behind. But it looks like it's a, not, it's a, I've been talking to many people it's all over the world like that. Well, so that was one of the first, uh, I would say, objectives and achievements. It's, uh, professional armed forces uh, in a democratic way of, uh, of relating to the uh, political authorities and so on and out. That's, in Chile, is very well done. And that's really, really good done. But on the other hand, we ask ourselves, well, what are the possible conflicts in our country? We don't want war. We don't look at war and nothing at all. But of course, you know, one of the first, uh, you know pretty well as, as a postgraduate, one of the first, uh, I would say, uh, responsibilities of state is its security and uh, its defense. And, but second of all, we do believe that Chile, even though we're small, and we are, are responsible also for the peace in the world. So our armed forces right now, uh, we have, uh, and from, from very early times, uh, we are in the Minusta in Haiti, in the first stage of Haiti, uh, in the last uh, period, we were there in the Minister, we're still there for so many years. We are in Cyprus, and we are in Bosnia-Herzegovina, in op o uh, Operation Altia. W and in other countries, we have been in, in Kosovo in the past, we have been in, 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 in uh, Congo, and, and some other countries, because we believe that our forces and our police forces can help build, rebuild uh, nations that have been having problems. So we have developed capabilities and equipment uh, to uh, NATO standards and to DPKA, um, DPKO, the Department of Peacekeeping Operations of United Nations Department, so our people can go in there. And uh, third, we said we need to modernize our, our army in uh, our, our, our forces. We, we do have until now, by law, but in real life it's different, I'll explain very briefly, mandatory um, 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 What's the word in English, let me say? Pre conscription. Mandatory conscription. Even though two, the two years is already 100% voluntary. But it's for law, it's mandatory conscription. And um, we decided that we had to have our forces smaller, but of course with the capacity of dissuasion. Is that the word in English, or dissuasion? Dissuasion? Uh, and and that, so they they are people who are not too big, are much smaller. The, today's armies are much smaller than it's before. For example, I, when I was Minister of Defense, the conscription 
was about uh, 20,000. Now we are in 13,000. So we've been diminishing. But and changes the, 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 the organization of the armed forces, joining. For the first time, we have been working and join, join, uh, join forces. So I would say it's more having the armed forces that can meet the challenges and the requirement of the defense in Chile, but outside the world needs. So I would tell you, we are not making any armament war, a career or something like that, a race. And uh, we, every time we buy something new, we put aside the old stuff. It's more renewable. And of course, as it is in health, every time you, you buy a new thing, it's much more expensive and probably more effective than the old thing. So it's not that we are increasing, we are just changing. And probably it's more costly because to have smaller group but uh, qualify is always more expensive, and that's why the nervous laughter of the Minister of Finance over there. <laughs> One question I can do. Yes, Thank you very much, Madam President. gave me license to ask one more thing, so um, I'll, I'll, try, I'll get over it. I actually, well, I have a very, very quick question for you, actually. You have in this audience a, a group of young people who would like to lead, women and men. You have done that. Do you have a brief word of advice, of inspiration for those people? How they get to where you're at? Well, the, the first advice would be not to desire to be in my, in my place. No, no, I'm not telling you it's a bad thing, it's that I never fight for it. And I think when people are too ambitious and fighting for something, people recognize that. So I would say the best suggestion is be true, uh, be honest, never promise what you won't do, what you won't be able to reach, Maybe some people think that they will never win an election in that way. But I, as I did thought that I had the chance to be a president of republic, even though I never looked for it, it just happened. And I mean, when people start looking at me and seeing me as a candidate, of course when I decide to be a candidate, it, I work for it, but I mean, <laughs> before that, it didn't pass my mind. I would have laughed so much. Are you crazy? But the thing is that I think that people uh, be genuine, um, no, genuine, genuine? Yes. Uh, because people need to believe in something, not only in causes, but also in people. Credibility is essential because of the things that I've been telling you that uh, are the problems of democracy. Credibility is very important. So I would say be honest, uh, make commitment, not promises, because you fulfill commitment. Promises are gone with the wind, you know? Rhetoric, is, it's, it's easy. But specifically if you think that you have the possibility, never, never promise what you are not gonna be able to do. I mean, of course, and, and the other thing is be always honest. We have had problems. We developed a policy in transportation that was wrong. I mean, not wrong, it worked bad. <laughs> I mean, the, the idea was good, but it, it didn't paper. And that's the other thing. Every time you develop a policy, think on the people, not on the system. When you think on the system, it works wonderful on the paper. But in the real life, sometimes it's, it's a complication for the people. But I tell you that because even though it worked wrong, I've always said to the people, yes, this was a mistake. I mean, not a mistake, it was a problem. We have a problem and we need to solve the problem. And what is, I mean, if, if as president or 
as a chief of government or as parliament or whatever you are interested in involving in politics or whatever. Um, if, you, if you're not there to work for the people, I mean, I think it's, it's really, that's the word. I'm, I'm always saying when I go everywhere in the country and I speak and I said, this is the reason why I'm here, to work for you, with you and by you, but, but for you. So I think if you really care for people, if you respect people, go into politics. If not, better do other sort of things because people deserve to be respected and cared. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Madam President. Have a safe evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.